we had the opportunity to look uh, in a large trial that we ran in the UK, um, the MARLAM11 trial, at uh, genetic risk markers and a combination uh, in newly diagnosed transplant eligible patients. Uh, the MARLAM11 trial is a trial that's currently still in follow-up, but it's quite mature already with a median follow-up time of 60 months, so it allows for not looking only at how patients do with frontline therapy, but also with second line or overall survival parameters actually. So we did uh, genetic analysis on over a thousand of these patients and this was more comprehensive than in many other trials that have been reported. So we looked in addition to the adverse translocations as well as gain of 1Q uh, and deletion 7MP. Um, and that of course allows a combination of factors so we can count operations and look at those without operations with one or with more than one operations because they are, these are partly overlapping and not mutually exclusive. Uh, so the gain of 1Q is gaining more traction and more attractiveness because the Emory group from Atlanta has recently done an analysis showing that it is prognostic in uh, VRD treated patients. I think this, this was uh, always a little bit still an unanswered question but now that we see it's nearly uniformly actually predictive across patient groups, I think our analyses are quite, uh, uh, quite widely translatable actually. So when we look at these double hit patients, these really behave like ultra high risk patients. Their median progression free survival unfortunately in myeloma 11 is only 20 months and even the upper margin of the uh, uh, confidence interval of 95% confidence interval is only 24 months. So really nearly all patients do progress within two years despite receiving a transplant. Now having said that, actually with some of the older IMIT-based triplet regimens on the trial, only about two-thirds of patients make it to transplant in the first place. Unfortunately the disease already progresses before uh, or uh, they just feel unwell and cannot undergo the transplant. Uh, this is better when they receive as a randomization in the trial a quadruplet regimen with carfilzomib nearly 90% make it to transplant off the double hits of the ultra high risk group. Uh, but unfortunately we see that still the progression free survival, although being better than with the other treatments, is still shorter than for the low risk standard risk groups. So neither the same number of patients reaches transplant, completes transplant, but regardless the PFS, the progression free survival for these patients is significantly shorter than for the standard risk patients without high risk markers. Because of the long follow-up, we then also had the chance to look at PFS2 and overall survival. And we saw that, unfortunately, this group of ultra-high-risk patients really benefits only very, very marginally from treatments that they get in third-line or in fourth-line treatment. So, uh, although they undergo subsequent therapies, the additional progression-free survival that they get from that is unfortunately very short. And that's in contrast to the standard-risk patients. They often gain many months of extra lifetime and progression-free time with subsequent therapy. So it really shows us we need to stratify these patients early. We need to understand what the genetic risk profile is early and then actually tailor therapy accordingly already in the first or the second line.